Austin, thank you so much for coming on the AIM podcast. Absolutely. I'm excited, brother. We've been talking about this for a while. I know. I know. Our, my good friend Jordan McCabe introduced us and connected us, and um, he's he's the best. But, dude, really pumped to have you on the show. Have a ton of respect for your your work ethic, your grind, how you've been able to be successful in so many different categories, obviously with basketball being kind of a foundational piece. But I'm um, really pumped to hear more about your story, man. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> 100%. Before we dive in, though, I got to know, the people need to know, how was golf this morning? I saw you were getting out on the course. Is that? Is yeah, that so like I, start, I started basically waking up earlier and – Listen, I, there's a lot of people I, I golf with, whether it's friends or work or whatever it is. And I'm not great. I'm not terrible, but I'm not great. Like if I break a hundred, it's a good day. And so I basically told myself like, I'm going to start getting up early. I'm going to go play nine holes or 18 holes before the day starts. Um, you know, if you play at six, you play eight holes by, I mean, nine holes by eight and 18 by 10 o'clock. And then you start your day. So most days I'll get in nine. Some days I'll get in 18, but it's a great way to start the day. That's super cool. And have you seen that you talked about it on your story, just kind of helping set your mind up, you know, therapeutic. How have you seen it kind of translate and impact your day? Yeah. I, I mean, golf is just like, it is a big stress reliever. It kind of helps get everything out. Um, but also I'm just so competitive. So um, starting the day off, you know, slowly getting better a little bit each time uh, just makes me feel a lot better. Dude, that's awesome. I, I definitely need, I need some help with my game, man. I, I played college basketball and never played golf. But then after I got done playing, I was like, I feel like this is a sport that most people should have at least some yeah. skill level and just to kind of hold your own to be able to go do it socially at least. Definitely. Let's go, man. Well, I want to talk to you. Obviously, you're doing a ton of cool things now, but I think for the listeners, like it'd be cool to hear more of your background and how you got even into the game of basketball. How what was that kind of first initial draw to the game and, and how did you kind of start playing the game? Yeah, I started playing super, super early. I got a big head start. Um, uh, my dad was a big diehard basketball guy. Um, was supposed to play uh basketball in college, was really good in high school messed up his knee ankle whatever it was in at the end of high school was supposed to play at university of texas never ended up playing so from when i was a kid we my dad was a laker ball boy and so we used to go to laker games all the time um obviously he was ball boy when he was younger but we were just around the lakers forever and so when i was a kid we used to go to games and i i mean i started playing like as soon as i could i was able to walk so i've been playing basketball forever that's in, that's incredible and what was the hoop scene like um growing up in california i grew up in north carolina and we yeah. always say like north carolina is the hoop state but i know california there's some other good states too how old is that hoop scene like in california yeah well first of all california is the best state for basketball <laughs> um if you look at the nba a lot of those guys are from california um Except for so MJ, right? I'm, I'm very passionate about that when i went to baylor i used to fight <laughs> all of my teammates on it because a lot of those guys were texas guys i'm like California basketball is way better, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it was, uh, it was super competitive. Um, obviously big city, you, you know, you had a lot of like ex players, kids, and um, sure. just monster athletes, kids coming here from other countries and moving to LA and playing at high schools here. And um, it was super competitive and played with a lot of guys who, you know, played in college and then played in the league. And um, yeah, it was, it was a cool experience. Did you have any kind of pivotal mentors growing up in the game of basketball outside of your personal family, like your father and stuff? Yeah, um, I did have, you know, great coaches and stuff. I think one cool mentor that I had um, in high school uh, was Katino Mobley. Um, he was like, you know, I, I was this is kind of how it was like growing up in LA is like you play basketball at these places and you run into these sorts of people. Sure. Uh, and Katino knew my dad and just kind of knew people around me. And so he kind of just like took me under his wing and taught me a bunch of, you know, like vet moves. And um, it, it, it honestly took my game from like being a kid into being, you know, an adult basketball player. That's awesome. No, I think, I think it's so cool to see. I was talking about this with someone else the other day, the power of the game, Obviously, we, we love the game of basketball, but just the way that it sets up for so many opportunities for you to be invested into from older, more you know wiser guys that can obviously teach you stuff on the court. But there's obviously a translation to life and different things, lessons you can learn. So it's cool to see how that mentorship can can shape you. I always say it's so crazy where it has brought me and taken me to today. Sure. You know, 
when I, I, I went and, and played in college. And then when I came back home, was doing some like freelance social media stuff, but I would play with people and then meet other people from that. But it was weird because I would meet these very successful, wealthy people and they're like inviting me to their house to come play and and inviting me to private games to come play. And I could never understand why, um, but it's just, you know, everyone, it's, it's kind of like you want what you can't have type thing. You know, these people have been very successful in business or whatever, and they're not really playing with NBA players. So like, you know, that next step, that next attainable thing for them is like that guy that played in college. And so, you know, they just want to be surrounded by, you know, someone who, who who's good at something that they love. Yeah, that's a great point, man. When was it like, I know you've I've heard, listened to other interviews and heard you talk about this. You had dreams and aspirations of playing professionally post-career. When was it that you kind of had to make that shift, but decide like consciously to still be around the game of basketball? Yeah, you know, um, I I feel like you got to be a realist in this life. Um, it's great to dream, but at some point it's, you know, you got to be like, okay, this is the reality of the situation. And so when I got to Baylor, I played um, a decent amount my junior year. I played behind our point guard, who was like one of the best point guards in the conference, which I totally was okay with. And he was a senior and had put in his time. So that was all good. And then my senior year... <laughs> I, I just continued to work my ass off and was always the hardest worker on the team. And my senior year, I didn't play as much. They brought in like new recruits and, you know, there's a lot of like politics and basketball. And so my senior year, when I realized like, Hey, I'm not playing that much. I'm not putting stats up. Like in order for me to play to super high level, whether it's, you know, in Europe or in the NBA, you gotta be not just playing, but putting up crazy numbers. And so I wasn't doing either one of those. And Luckily, I fell into the social media thing. I started going viral on social my senior year in college, which just kind of led me very naturally into the next thing. And what what year was that? That was 2016. Wow. So that was before, like, I mean, obviously social media was still relevant then, but where it is now, it's in a totally different spot. Totally, totally different. Um, people were posting on social, like, for just personal reasons. I mean, there yeah. were influencers weren't really like a thing it was kind of around the same time as vine so people were just starting to discover social like as a job or you know as a as a some somewhere to grow um and so i kind of it was just good timing 100 percent. so you you kind of get to the point you talk about being a realist where you you figure that maybe pro the professional route's not the direction you're going to head you start making social media content what else was kind of going through your mind during that transitional process from playing college basketball to kind of setting you up to, you know, where you are now? Yeah, I think that one of the other harder things for me is I grew up in LA, which to me is one of the best cities in the world. And so, you know, you go play basketball overseas and I was hearing stories from friends and, and people I knew that were playing overseas telling me, you know, I'm away from my friends. I'm away from my family. People don't speak English here. Sometimes I don't get, I don't get paid. Like, a lot of things that were deterring me um, from going and playing. Another thing was, you know, I didn't want to be at the end of my career at 32 years old playing basketball, haven't made that much money. I come back to LA and I'm like, okay, where do I start now? Sure. Um, so those, all those things kind of led me to be like, Hey, let me take these opportunities that are coming my way in social media. It'll allow me to go back home, be around my family, be around my friends, do the things that I love, still be in basketball, um, obviously not play professionally and make money doing it, but you know, I was playing in celebrity games and playing in adult leagues and things that were kind of like scratching the itch a little bit, not fully, but allowing me to like, take my mind off of, you know, ending that pro career. For sure. No, that makes a ton of sense. It's uh, I've got a couple of buddies. One, one of my friends is playing in Columbia right now and, uh, he's actually having a great season. Their team's actually playing the championship tonight for their league. But I know it's been a common theme throughout his last few years of playing pro. It's just the the language barrier, just the inconsistency of certain certain things, and it's it's definitely a huge commitment, and it's a, it's a lot of sacrifice too to do that. Yeah, I, I, the other thing is everyone has their path. You know, like I don't think that there's. I think it's great for people to go and play overseas. I think if you have those opportunities and they're coming your way, it's fantastic. Um, and for a lot of people, they need to go seek that first in order to be like either this is for me or this isn't for me. Um, luckily I just had opportunities come my way where I didn't have to go travel there in order to see like, okay, this might not be for me. 
Yeah, for sure. I'm curious. I mean, you you obviously are, are a great shooter. You've got great uh, fundamentals and, and a great foundation to your game. Have you ever considered going into like the player development route or training route? Or have you always kind of enjoyed more of the media side, creating content, the business, that that kind of side of the game? I already have too many jobs as it is now. I have like five different jobs. Um, I, <laughs> right after college, like kind of as a side hustle, I was training kids just for fun. Um, and I think it's something I want to get into later. It would be great to be able to be successful and be financially stable where I could, you know, whether it's coach my kids in AAU or coach my kids in high school. I, I don't know if I would coach kids unless they were my own. Um, but I've always obviously thought, you know, it'd be sick to coach college basketball or it'd be sick to coach the NBA. Um, I think that I could do it. I just... I wouldn't be able to add it to my plate. For sure. Spe- speaking of your plate, like what what are some of the main things you're you're focused on right now? I know there's there's a lot of different buckets for you, and I'm super curious how you kind of balance everything. So it all start it all started with social media, and then I I was able to get hosting opportunities with the NBA right after college. That those were the opportunities that I spoke about earlier, and so hosting is something that I've always been very passionate about. I always compare myself to like Ryan Seacrest, where you know I'm producing a show, hosting a show. And so I just had a show on E last in the, within the last year where we went and saw celebrities cars. I produced that as well. I'm producing a couple shows that are in the works. Now these projects take a lot of time to actually come to fruition. So, you know, it's like, you got to film it and package it and then pitch it. And then it takes time for the, whatever the network or the streaming company to get back to you have a decision. So um, those are projects that I'm currently working on. There's a couple in the pipeline. That's usually my main focus. Um, I have my real estate license when friends and want to come and buy houses in LA or, or somewhere nearby, I'll help them with that. My family's in real estate. So that's a pretty easy one. Um, I own some basketball pages. um, So we have that network and launched a clothing line because of those basketball pages. And so instead of selling merch, we sell cool clothes. A um, bunch of NBA guys are wearing it, friends. Um, and then another focus as of right now is DJing. Um, one thing that I realized is when I was working with these brands and doing the social media stuff in the beginning, a lot of DJs were out there at the same events I was, not only making money to be there, but also making money to DJ. So I wanted to double dip as well. I used to DJ in middle school. I had to stop with the basketball. So I was able to pick it back up again partnered with a friend of mine. We DJ at a bunch of places um, across the country and sometimes the world. Um, and we're going to be putting out music of our own and kind of just see how that goes. Bro, that is unbelievable. I, I love it, man. I love it. It's one thing to talk to someone who's doing a bunch of different things within the same realm, but I, and I know there's, there's definitely a connection between what you're doing, but you're doing things in a lot of different spaces. How are you able to like organize the workflow and the schedule and the balance of all those things? It's really hard. Luckily, I um, was able to have someone come work with me as of recently, who's pretty good on the social media side of things. So he helps me with a lot of like content creation and content management, helping me post things and helping me make things, um, which has been super helpful for me. Um, But honestly, the real estate aspect for me has created a lot of opportunities because the real estate portion has been able to financially help me afford creating pilots for shows, um, traveling and making music, um, you know, just, it, it kind of like all ties together. I know it does, might not seem like it, but it does. A lot of the people we meet DJing or I meet making these shows will buy real estate. It, it all somehow ties together, which, uh, at the end of the day, it ends up working, but it is, I will say it is difficult trying to find time for everything. For sure. For sure. No, I can't imagine. And I'm sure you, you touching so many different places, one relationship that you might have, you might be able to service them with different types of value from all these different angles. So I'm sure that, that makes you pretty lethal. Right. <laughs> Let's go. What, what does a typical day in a life look like for you? It's just, it honestly really depends on the day. Um, you know, some days are content days where we set aside hours to make content for our DJing pages, or I make content for brand deals that I'm doing on my own stuff. Um, I help my mom with her content as well, but 
some days are content days. Some days are days where I'm showing people houses. Some days are days where I'm downloading music, practicing DJing. It just, it honestly really varies on things that are going on um, and travel. Yeah, for sure. Do you have a favorite thing that you do or is everything just kind of, you just enjoy it all? <laughs> uh, I, I really do enjoy it all. Um, the DJing is probably the most fun. I love entertaining and hyping up crowds. Um, the hosting when I actually have projects in play is incredible. Being able to hang out with celebs and have real organic conversations with celebrities, I think is really cool. Um, but I think being an entertainer has always been obviously, you know, being on social media and, and having shows and DJing is, is kind of has always been like my, my interest in what keeps me going. For sure. I've heard you talk about, you know, the aspiration of wanting to have your own talk show. Uh, of some sort. What is it about that that interests you? And, and why do you think that that's such a big calling on your life? I have always been a super positive, happy person. Um, and I think that it's super infectious. I think that people, ru it rubs off on other people. And I think there's a lot of people out there that are struggling or might need like a pick me up. And that's what I found from a lot of these shows growing up is oh, these people are such happy, cool, entertaining people who are also able to give back at the same time. Obviously, I can't afford to, you know, help every person afford to eat on this planet. But what I can do is have a show that creates a platform and raises money for people to be able to, you know, receive these things or, or you know, change people's lives, which like Ellen DeGeneres, for example, is a great example of what I would love to do eventually is have celebrities on, entertain people and be able to give back. That's incredible, man. What do you think has been the big, one of the biggest factors of, of your success up to this point? I think it's just grind, honestly. And that, and going back to basketball again is one of those things where it's like that just mentally teaches you something different as a kid. There's, there is, nothing harder than being an athlete, um, especially when you're putting in the extra mile. And so, you know, in college, you're like waking up early, going to the gym, going to class. Then you're like going to tutoring and then you're going to the gym and then practice. And then the gym again, like I was sleeping like a couple hours a night, I would spend most of my time in the gym. And so I think that really prepared me. And then my mom always just taught me be nice to everyone. And I think that being nice to everyone has created a lot of like opportunities and, and relationships for myself. So, you know, a combination of hard work and relationships. Those are, those are two really good ones, man. I appreciate it. But this is, this has been a great episode. I have a couple quick fire questions to ask you. I know you, yep. you, uh, we've got to be sensitive to your time here, but favorite kicks on the court. Um, and you can give two answers here. If you want to do like when you're playing collegiately to now, or if now is like your favorite, but what are some of your go-to uh, kicks on the court? Uh, it was always Kobe's, Kobe's forever. Um, I grew up on Kobe, Kobe here, so I do have some bias, but aside from the bias, I do really think it is one of the best basketball shoes of all time. Um, fours, fives, sixes, and I think the Kobe 8 is the greatest shoe ever. It's my favorite shoe to play in. Um, I've been playing in the fives a lot just because I have them here. Um, as of recently, I found the Giannis and I really like the honest, I think probably because it's pretty similar to a Kobe. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Kobe's are the best. What, who is your dream artist to DJ for or DJ with? If you could pick anyone in the world to DJ with. Or so for? in terms of dream artists, yeah, we produce the music. So usually how it works is like, we'll make the track and then have someone come on and sing on the track with us. Yeah. I think like this is pretty random. Um, but in terms, we make dance music. So in terms of dance music, like one of the goats to have on a dance song would be like either Calvin Harris because he can sing slash produce with us. Or I think Ellie Goulding would be really sick to have, uh, as a vocalist on a track. Dude, let's go. I, I feel like you're, you're going to make it happen, man. I think so too. I think it'll happen. <laughs> I think it'll happen. If you could play one-on-one -on -one with anyone in the world, you know, past or present, currently playing, who, who would that be? If you could pick, play one-on-one -on -one with anyone. I would say, um, ooh, that's a tough one. Because I wouldn't pick a basketball player. Really? Because I've, I've pretty much met most basketball players, and I, I, and I, I think it would be more fun to play with someone 
um, who I could like cr- create a relationship with outside of basketball. Yeah. Um, it's like kind of how my mind works. Um, <laughs> it, it would have to be someone along the lines of like, a Mark Cuban or like he's a little older, so that one-on-one game wouldn't be like super. You crush him. <laughs> um, maybe Obama, he's a little older too. Uh <laughs> that's a really tough question. Who's like in the probably someone like entertainment industry slash successful business person that uh is on the younger side and, and good at, at basketball? I have to think about that one. For sure. I got you, bro. That, no, that's a good way to think about it. We've had some uh, we've had some awesome guests on the show. I think prior to this episode, I would say Jimmer Fredette is probably our our best shooting guest we've had on the show. I don't know how you feel you stack up against him, but we I think it's it's safe to say we can open up the conversation maybe. Uh, Jimmer was one of my idols growing up for sure. <laughs> um, when shoot, sorry, when uh, let me turn that off. When um, I I was in high school, he was in college and it was just like, obviously he was making crazy waves in the culture. He was kind of like the Steph Curry before Steph Curry. Facts. And he was someone that I really, really looked up to and probably took a few shots that I shouldn't have. In- <laughs> <laughs> and if those, if you're taking Jimmer shots and they don't get, they don't go in, you're <laughs> probably sitting on the bench. <laughs> For sure. Man. Well, dude, awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been an absolute blast. Absolute love what you're doing. I just love your positive energy, man. It's contagious and uh, just want to be, you know, supportive in any way I can for for all the awesome stuff you're doing, man. Well, I'm very happy that we finally figured this out. I know this took a while. I'm sorry it took so long, um, but happy I came on. Um, happy to back up Jimmer and uh, thankful to be on here. You're the man. Thank you so much, bro. All right, brother.